in the near future be able to share some more on the topic. I don't want you to take this as kind of a heavy thing. You know, stewardship is so, it's just really the authority and responsibility God's given us in covenant with him to operate um, uh, according to his word. So what is it when you think about Christian stewardship? You know, one definition I located about Christian stewardship said it's faithfully developing and using our gifts, our talents, and resources within the amount of time God has allotted to us in a manner consistent with the truths of his word. So it's really about staying in his word, following his word, following the example of Jesus and the apostles in terms of applying our gifts, knowing that it's not about us, but it's what he's given us. And so, you know, as it is with our covenant relationship with God, uh, likewise is our stewardship relationship. You know, there's two partners involved in a covenant. We didn't have anything to do with the formation of the covenant that God established through Jesus Christ's shed blood. That was all a work of God. But through faith, we're invited in. We're invited to be part of that covenant, to have really the benefits, not having done any of the work to establish it, but we receive all the benefits and blessings that come as we enter into that covenant by way of faith. So two partners are involved. And, of course, in a, in a stewardship relationship, there's the master or the overseer or the owner in the traditional sense of stewardship and ourselves as the servants. That's the relationship, also known as stewards. So it doesn't mean a slave relationship, but it means a relationship where there's something that both parties contribute into the relationship. The master or owner, or owner provides the resources, and one day he will ask for an accounting. That's normal in a relationship between a steward and his, uh, a master and his steward, that there will be a day of reckoning with respect to what was given by the master and what we did with it. God is the master and the owner, and he distributes at his discretion. So he's free to give what he gives, he's free to provide talents, giftings, all those things, the resources at his discretion. It's all his. The fundamental truth of biblical stewardship is we own nothing. We own nothing. The old truth is, you know, I came into the world with nothing and kind of like leave it with, with nothing. But there is legacy and there is something that we do, in fact, uh, do leave with in terms of uh, what we've accomplished for the kingdom. So God is the sole owner. God owns everything. We're simply like managers. You know, if you, I don't know whether how many of you have been in management positions, but I had the blessing of being in management for the company for some 26 years. I worked for a crown corporation, Canada Post, and I was promoted in there to a management level. And in a management level, um, you know, you're entrusted with, the resources of the company and the certain boundaries with that. You're given a budget, uh, you're given a staff, and you're given uh, a number of regulations around that to work with, and you're held usually annually. You're assessed on how well you did with what you were given. And so there's measurement, praise God. <laughs> and so, uh, so you're entrusted with that. So you don't own the operation, you don't own the people, you don't own the facility, but you're placed in a position of responsibility, given quite a long list with as you are with most companies of responsibilities. And uh, so there's all kinds of things. So it's it's a wonderful experience, but there's you know there's stresses with that, there's strifes with that, there's all kinds of things you go through. And uh, but it represented a stewardship role that was training for me and human relations, how people react, because it was, it was a union environment, it was busy, it was, you know, it was under time pressures in terms of scheduling and all these things. So, you know, just likewise, so in our spiritual relationship, that's just a comparison, but in our spiritual relationship, we too are managers of what God's given us. We don't own the resources, but the Word of God exhorts us repeatedly to understand that the resources of God. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18 says this in the NIV. It says, you may say to yourself, 
sometimes in life we get our, to our place where we've accomplished a lot and we kind of get a good sense about ourselves and there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes we get overly reliant on how those possessions came to us or how that promotion and placement and elevation came in life. But he said, oh, well, you may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you the ability and power to get wealth. Remember even the source of your abilities. You know that God has deposited in you in the substance of when you were formed. He gave you, yes, there's a general human design in our DNA, but then there's specialty. Then there's individuality. Then there's specifics that are imparted to each individual that God knows intimately more than you do. He's given you these. The scripture calls on the children of Israel in this scripture, called on them to keep the owner, the source, in correct perspective. God is the source. God is the provider. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the giver of all things. He's the giver of life. He's the designer of life. You know, the Apostle Paul emphasized the same truth at the church in Corinth. He said this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 8 and 6. He said, for us there is but one God. Father, the Father from whom all things come and from whom we live, there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Praise God. Rodney in the worship touched on this. All things come from him. And there's one Lord through whom all things came. Father God designed a great plan. Jesus spoke that plan. Creation. Holy Spirit powered it, caused it to come into creation. So you are not your own. It says this, God reminds us too, we are not our own. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? So you received this fleshly life from God, but you've also received in it the capacity to be a temple. God's designed the human body and soul to be a temple, hallelujah, where he can dwell, hallelujah, where you can worship God, where you can know God and communicate with God. You're not your own. You were bought. The other thing is you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Honor God with the resources, giftings he's blessed you with. So we see here that God uh, has ownership over us both by virtue of creation and virtue of redemption. Both by creation, he created you, designed you, and then because you were in a fallen state, he redeemed you to your original placement because you had fallen. We're all children of Adam, and so we carry the taint of the fall. And so that only remedy or cure or antidote for that is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ is the redemption that purchased us and put us back to the original plan of God. Praise His name. In creation, God is clearly presented as creator. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in the New Testament, it says this of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, 15 and 16. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, all things, people, were created through him and for him. An awesome description of the ownership and rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we accept this awesome revelation that our lives are not our own, but our sacred trust given to us by God, then we have to choose to spend our lives not aimlessly or without purpose or value or in selfish pursuit. He did not, he did this intentionally. He designed us intentionally. We get to discover. We get to discover the intention of God for each of our lives. It's a journey by which, you know, in this life, we can find out what really God intended 
for you, what destiny he has for you, what's special about you. And it's available to us. Sometimes we ignore it and we go through life just trying to figure out things on our own, trying to make our own decisions and not relying on Holy Spirit to direct our lives on a daily basis and direct us and know the will of God unfolding for us, the purpose of God unfolding for us. So we have this awesome privilege to get to know intimately the one who created us. What an awesome thought. The one who created you wants to know you in a deeper, more intimate, and uh, loving way. That's the kind of relationship he desires. So he calls you. Deep calls on to deep. And so we know we are not meaningless accidents. The human race and individual, we're not human. We're not accidents of the natural realm. You know, the theory that really dominates, the theory that dominates the education system and and most scientists and intellectuals is the, you know, the theory of evolution, that that's how man was formed. Somehow out of some chemicals coming together in the mud or some great big bang in the universe, that life started out of this. Although there's no evidence for that that's really firm, that people would accept that rather than accept Creator God as the designer and maker of their lives. So if you follow, the thing is, though, when we follow that uh, theory, when we follow that premise that human understanding uh, has given us, human life then becomes cheap and devalued. It becomes lowered, cheap and devalued. You know, and then first of all, things then become disposable. Human life becomes disposable in that theory because, well, you know, people are evolving and, you know, what's the difference? If there is no God, then it makes no difference whether the unborn die, you know, die in the womb, whether or not there's, you know, euthanasia, whether or not there's genocide or racism, what does it matter? If there's no God, it doesn't matter. There's no rules. There's no standards. But that lie, you know, is the problem that we have in the world today. You know, rather than intent, you know, choosing to believe in a God that intentionally chose you to be alive in this generation, to be alive now, that you're God's choice. And you're in God's kingdom by his choice. You know, if we miss this truth, nothing else in the word of God makes sense. That in the beginning, Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything about the Bible is foundational in that statement. Everything else that's taught in the word of God is founded in the fact that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, really, out of that statement flows everything every other truth of the Word of God. You know, God's entrusted to mankind, not to angels or some other beings. He's trusted to mankind stewardship over the resources of the earth he created. He's given dominion to man. He chose man to be his preferred choice to have dominion and stewardship over his creation here on earth. And, of course, he's going to hold him accountable for the results of that assignment. And, uh, you know, this was spoken concerning man's stewardship over the earth. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, he said, then God said, let us make man in our image. Well, that's very important right off, right off out of the beginning here of the creation of man, that he's made in his image. That is, he's given him his stamp of himself on humanity. That right away, if you're made in his image, how many know you're capable? <laughs> If you're made in the image and likeness of God, you have some capabilities right away. Amen. Before he's put other things there, he's made you in the image and likeness of God. Our image, according to our likeness, let him have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's an equality statement there. And, you know, the worst is, you know, a lot of societies are still struggling with this statement. But, you know, God, in the very first statement about the dominion, 
he said he created, the, in his image, he created them male and female. He cre created them and he blessed them. So he didn't, a, a male dominant society was not God's idea. <laughs> it was not God's original plan. He said to them, hallelujah. Then he blessed them and God said to them, both of them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, and over everything that moves on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. God's grand plan for the human race, a commissioning to establish human society all over the world, from the Garden of Eden to expand the human society in righteousness and holiness across the face of the earth, to expand their numbers, but to also expand the truth of who God was, to take their relationship that they had with him when they walked with him in the cool of the evening, when they had that wonderful fellowship, to take that and expand that throughout human society. That was God's plan, that everybody would know their God, that everybody would be blessed to know and have a relationship with their God, to know his love. And that was God's plan. And God did not mess up that plan, but Adam and Eve did mess up that plan. So the mandate is dominion in the context of also stewardship. Not as, again, not as owners and not free to do as we choose outside the will and the ways of God and his wisdom. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the evening before the fall. In this relationship, God imparted his wisdom. See, it's not just about, you know, a cool, nice walk. He was imparting wisdom to them, knowledge to them. He was training them. He was teaching them. He was imparting things to them. He, so the relationship had education for them in it. That was their school. This is, yeah, that was where they were learning how to do this multiply how to do this expansion, how to fulfill their destiny and establish godly society out of them for the rest of, the, for the rest of humanity. So Adam and Eve walked with him, and he imparted that wisdom. Psalm 24, 1 tells us, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 50 and 10 says, Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle... God says, on a thousand hills are mine. But then he says this in Psalm 115 to 16. The highest heaven belongs to the Lord, but earth he has given to man. That is given in the sense of responsibility to oversee, manage, and give an accounting for. Praise God. Right now there's this controversy over the environment and the United States dropping out of the um, Paris Accords. And, you know, this is a... You know, in a sense, there's a rising kind of sense of stewardship for the earth, and um, and that's a good thing. And uh, but you know, the part that's missing in the secular stewardship of the earth is the expansion of the kingdom of God, the wisdom of God that's to be multiplied. Because in the wisdom of God, you can get the other thing right. <laughs> you can get the right accords in the wisdom of God. But without God, you're just getting, again, some more layering of human wisdom that um, is kind of sometimes just hit and miss. So the creation is not given under our stewardship to do as we please, to fulfill our own lusts, and that's often what's happened. That's why so much of the environment spoiled because of the lust of man. Right? It's been given over to greed and all these other um, self-fulfilling visions men have to uh, ravage the earth for their own profit rather than to fulfill the, God, the, the, the destiny God has for humanity on the earth. To apply his wisdom found in his word and with the power of the Holy Spirit, which today we recognize on Pentecost, the power of the Holy Spirit, working in us to accomplish that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And if we'll submit ourselves to it, we can see it in our own lives. We can see his promises fulfilled. We can see his resources, his gifts and talents that he's given us, his opportunities he's given us. We can see them open up for us, knowing this, that we'll all stand before him. It says we'll all stand before him. That is Jesus. It says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, just let me stop here. The judgment seat of Christ is not the judgment seat of eternity about salvation. This has to do with the giving and 
the giving of rewards. So it's really, it's not the judgment seat. The judgment seat of Christ that we're all going to appear before, we're appearing before Christ in heaven. Hallelujah. The issue of heaven and hell has been determined on earth by your decision to choose Christ. Once chosen, this is about how we've handled the resources we've been given. And so it says this, for each one may receive all the things done in the body according to what he has done, good or bad. And 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 15 says, for we are, God, for we are God's fellow workmanship. We are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me. Paul's saying here, as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it. That is, he laid down the gospel uh, to the Gentiles and others have built on that. But he said, let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of which sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So it's stating right here that it's not about salvation, whether or not your work is accepted or not. Listen, you know, the fact of the matter is we're all moving through this life, and how we do things and what we do things, um, whether they bring glory to God, and sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. You know, the fact of the matter is when we enter into heaven, God's going to clean us up. <laughs> you know, God's going to clean us up, uh, you know, because there will be things we've done that maybe aren't the right motive. There may be things you've done and you thought they were the right motive. You thought they were, but they weren't. Well, Jesus is going to, you know, take those, you know, take, remove those so that you can live in perfection with him. You know, you can't enter into the place of perfection still carrying imperfections in your soul. Knowing this, though, that your spirit right now is holy and righteous. There's no imperfection in your spirit. If there's any imperfection, that's within your soul, right? You're perfected. You know, it says you're created. When you were recreated by the born-again experience, you were created in true righteousness and holiness. So when we're singing, oh, God, I want to be holy, I want to be holy. Well, that's, you know, there's truth to that, that we want to live a holy life. We want the holiness that God's put in us to be fulfilled in our lives. We want to walk before God. We want to walk in that true righteousness and holiness. But because you fail to, to sometimes walk in true righteousness and holiness doesn't mean you fall out of being holy. doesn't mean you fall out of salvation or fall from grace. You don't fall from grace. Your spirit is sealed by the Holy Spirit. It's sealed. It's impenetrable by sin. Your soul and body are not. So when we talk about things like the, uh, you know, the work of sin in our lives and the work of our failures and our weaknesses, we must recognize that, you know, our sins, it declares this in the book of Romans, are no longer being imputed, accounted to us. If they've all been accounted to Jesus Christ on the cross, there's none left for you to be imputed with, right? So when you sin, you need to confess your sins so that your soul is purged, but your, your, your spirit is pure. So when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, it's really about issues of the heart that have been through the wrong motivations in your life, right? Right? I mean, the purging of the Spirit, the purging by fire at the judgment seat of Christ is something that you can experience in this life. You can experience the purging of Holy Spirit in this life. You can check your motivations. So sometimes what we've done, though, is we've missed out on that. But we can, you know, Jesus said, you know, you know judge not, you know, judge yourself that you not be judged. But the first place of judgment for all of us is in this life is daily to judge ourselves. Why am I doing this? Is this you, God? Do you want me to do this? Is this you influencing my heart? Or am I, I being led by another spirit? Do you need to purge the selfishness out of me or the check my motives? Because this is really what this is about. 
when it talks about two kinds of things here, that it talks about gold, silver, and precious stones, you know, and then it talks about wood, hay, and straw. And so, of course, wood, hay, and straw, as soon as fire hits wood, hay, and straw, it's destroyed. <laughs> it's burnt right up. But when it touches gold, when fire touches gold, silver, or precious stone, it refines them. Right? It refines precious metal. If there's any remnant of impurity in the precious stone or the gold or the silver, that's refined greater. The impurity is burned off. So even, even our best stuff can, ha can need the refiner's fire. Right? Can need the refiner's fire. Can need the refiner's fire all the time to check our motives. Hallelujah. So not every human, not all human work is perfect. Jesus' work was perfect. But some impurities there, and Jesus will cleanse that from us so that our soul, hallelujah, that will be with him for eternity, is, is made in, to perfection. That when we see him face to face, when we all see him face to face, that purging fire will do that cleansing work. Removing impurity, removing what's no good, and move us, hallelujah, closer to him to be his bride. Hallelujah, to be with him forever. I mean, no, we have to be like him. And he will complete the work that we left in some stage of not total completion here. Although we're striving, we want to do the best. But Jesus is ultimately going to do that cleansing and purging at his judgment seat. So this is not a good thing. I mean, this is not a bad thing. This is a good thing for us. It says that for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work, what sort it is. So Jesus will do the sortation and Jesus will do the purging of what's good. And he'll reward, you know, he'll reward what is good. So key truths about this, um, this, uh, number one, this is a judgment concerning rewards to be gained or lost, not salvation. The judgment is for Christians only. It's not the great white throne judgment of revelation that's reserved for the wicked that are without Christ. So it's reserved for the church. Secondly, there's only one acceptable foundation to build on in this life. Paul declared it, which is Jesus. That is whatever we do. We should do with Jesus in mind. We should do it in our working life. We should do it in our family life. We should do it in every area of life. Would this be pleasing to Jesus? Is God pleased with this? Does he, you know, is he influencing me in this? What is my motive? Thirdly, the motive of our works will be judged. The motive of our works. Jesus himself will judge our work, not only by the actual fruit of our work, that is, what did it do in the earth, what kind of legacy did it leave? Did it leave people in a better situation? Did your life leave people, saved or unsaved, just people generally, did you leave them in a better situation because you were here? Are people better because you lived in your generation? That's a question to ask yourself. Are they better for my presence in this life? Because you want to be able to say that's fruitful. But the other thing is also our motives will be judged. Those are a little bit more difficult to discern for each other, but not for Holy Spirit of God and not for Jesus. The eyes of the Lord are described by the Apostle John in Revelation 1.14. It says, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. So when Jesus looks at you, he'll look right into your heart. And what you even don't know there, he'll take care of. He'll take care of in your heart. Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 26, For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. It will be known. Those things built out of the correct motivation are described as gold, silver, and precious stone. And they'll survive the test, and they'll be further enhanced by the examination of Jesus. Gold, silver, and diamonds are all material that fire, as I said, refines. Other materials, like wood, hay, straw, they're burned or destroyed by fire. So this is the comparison Paul uses. So God seeks to, you know, to that he would be glorified in the work of man. So they represent 
works that may be on the surface. Sometimes the, our work appears to be done for God. But the flaming eyes of Jesus, which is really the purging of the Holy Spirit, will judge the motivation of the heart. If the motive was for selfish reasons, there's no reward. God, you know, Jesus said, you know, if you, if you did things to please men, please yourself, then he said, in the earth you have your reward. You know, you had your reward in the earth. But the things that you did that bless people, sometimes even unknown, those are reserved in the deeper place of the heart. Jesus knows your inventory. He knows your good works. He knows what you've done that have been a blessing. And remember, again, this is not about salvation. Your salvation is secure because you're in Christ. Praise God. This is about rewards. You know, motive, motive is, a, is as important as the work itself. Perhaps even more important than the work and the fruit is the motive. The reason why we do things is as important as what we might accomplish in the good thing we do. The reason we do things. Got a story for you to consider. There was a young man in the early part of the last century, uh, William Borden. He left um, a very wealthy situation. He was born to wealth. He was born into a very wealthy American family, East Coast family, established money and businesses, prosperous. He had, you know, the choice of any of the great schools to go to, universities, and um, or to choose a business or a career, what he wanted, or just to live in the wealth of a life of leisure and recreation because the family was so wealthy. But William Borden got born again as a young man, and uh, he left his wealth in America in 1913 to serve as a missionary in Egypt. So he went to a mission with a group of missionaries that were working in the poverty uh, ghetto of Cairo in Egypt, in that city. And he was only there three months, and he acquired, uh, contracted cerebral meningitis, and he died just a short time later. So he'd only been there three months, having established, having accomplished virtually nothing in the way of visible fruit. He'd just gotten started, was kind of under training. and um, So, you know, would Jesus count his motive as fruitfulness? His motive, you know, his heart. He didn't accomplish much fruit, didn't see great salvations or epic crusades or couldn't, you know, give a, give a long list of uh, a performance, a great missionary performance. He couldn't do that. He passed away early. And many said, what a, you know, many back home said, what a waste of a life. What a waste of a young man's life. But really, what did his life count for to Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ? Didn't have much fruit, but what about his heart? What about his heart to give up all that, to lay down all that, you know, that he had, the opportunity of a, you know, leisurely life or a quiet life without any disturbance to find himself there and to find himself contracted this deadly disease and to die at 24. And there's a, you know, he's buried in a small cemetery in, in Cairo, and um, in in a in a the back there, I think it says on his tombstone, you know, a life lived for Christ. You know, it doesn't depend so much how long the life is, but was the life lived for Christ? And he could say it was, despite there wasn't a lot of fruit. There was the motive. You know, when Jesus looks at the motive, he said the man's motive. In fact, his life mirrors Christ. Christ laid down heaven to come to earth, humbled himself, became a man, you know, abandoned the glory, he left behind the glory of heaven to come to a dusty place of Nazareth, and, you know, you know, humbled himself to the cross. So here, you know, here we have this man. You know, his plan was not fulfilled, but he was not negligent to the calling. He took the calling. And um, he lived in obedience to that, and he died in obedience. And there's the difference. You know, Adam and Eve, they had dominion. 
But they abandoned that. They gave their authority up to the enemy. Their sin resulted in the loss of their dominion. In fact, the dominion was usurped through the deception of the enemy who lied to them, that they could be their own God. They could rule and reign on their own. They didn't need God. Their sin downgraded their relationship with the creation. God spoke this judgment over Adam in Genesis 3, 17 and 19. He said, curse be the ground for your sake. So the curse came to the ground, came to the earth. By the sweat of your brow, it says, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. But thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So, you know, toil came to man. Toil. You know, toil is not the blessing of God. It's the curse that's in the earth and reinforced by the enemy. You know, much of the earth is working in toil. God didn't plan our lives for toil. He planned our lives for creativity and productivity, but not toil, not the pain of trying to get by in life. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, take a look at the birds or the lilies. They don't toil. God's not looking for us to toil in life. He's looking for your creativity. Much of, the earth, much of the hardest working people in the earth, the hardest working people are the poorest people in the earth. If you look to some areas of the earth, there's children, 8, 9, 10 years old, in places like India, breaking bricks 12 hours a day, busting them up. That's what they're doing. They're toiling. You know, there's women carrying water miles on their head in Africa. That's toil. It's not the earth that God planned. You know, he planned man to have dominion and to live creatively and do things of the desires of his heart, their hearts that God's given them. But people are locked in toil because of the curse. The kingdom of God liberates people from toil. Hallelujah. You should go to your work every day and you shouldn't look at it as toil. You should look at it as the opportunity to influence the, the, where you are for the kingdom of God. Say, how today can I influence my workplace, my school place, my recreation place, my wherever place, how can I influence it for the kingdom? How can I make the kingdom mandate, hallelujah, to bring the glory of God into the earth? How can I touch somebody with the grace and love of God today? What could I say to somebody, you know, today? You know, Simone and I were doing a few, distributing some postcards into the community around here uh, for this invitation to the VBS program. I often thought as I went around, I thought, how do these people see this church? You know, how do they, what do they think about when I say, well, I'm from the uh, church just over here at 40 Mile Street. I think what goes through their mind, people that don't know God? What do we look like to them? We often, I know what sometimes we, you know, what they look like to us, but what do we look like to them? You know, here we are Sunday morning, but what? You know, how do we influence that neighborhood? So many unsaved out there. Very few, I think, I ran into that might have been saved. But how do I touch that? How do I reach this, like, this expanding neighborhood for, with the dominion mandate, with the mandate that God loves them, that this, you know, this gospel message of God's love, and how do we, how do, we do that? I, I got to say to you today, I'm not quite sure how, how, exactly how to do it. I, you know, I love to reach them, and it's not a problem to, to go out and, but, but how, what's the how to, what's the creative thing? What's God's creative way to reach them? Not his toil way, you know, not his labor, because we're to enter his rest, and we're to operate out of rest. We're to feel, we should go out there and feel very much at peace. We should be able to touch people with the peace of God, not agitation. But God's restored us to authority. Jesus restored us. The good news is that we've been redeemed by the cross of Christ. Colossians 1.14, I, whom we have, whom we have re redemption through, his blood and the forgiveness of sin. And in that redemptive work, we are restored to that dominion authority. You've got to walk in that. You've got to believe, people, that you have this because it's invested in you. It's deposited in your spirit. 
He said, all things are yours, Paul said. So authority is yours. Authority is yours. You can, now the enemy's been defeated, you can't enforce that in your place of influence for the kingdom. You can enforce that. That's the role God always intended for men and women. Jesus said to this, he said, I give you authority. I give it to you. Luke 10, 19, behold, I give you authority. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And scorpions and serpents, they're just representations from the animal kingdom of the kingdom of darkness, from demonic forces in the kingdom of darkness. And those can range from everything from sickness and disease. That's what can be a scorpion. That hurts like a scorpion hurts, you know. Debt, poverty, they bite people just like a serpent. These are all areas of evil that Jesus said, I give you authority over those things, those serpents and scorpions, those things from the kingdom of darkness to take authority over, to bind them up, to stop their work and loose the work of heaven, loose the word of God, loose the spirit of God. Hallelujah. Just even now, just loosing the word of God into this community, saying, be saved to this ward here. Hallelujah. To these streets. Be saved to the people on Ontario Street and Toronto Street and Neve Street and Margaret Street and Richardson and hallelujah to all these streets around here, to Howitt Street and all these streets. I just speak salvation. I rebuke the work of the enemy to hold people in darkness, to hold them in the grip of darkness. In the name of Jesus, we just loose the authority of heaven and say, be whole, be saved. Come to Jesus. Come to your Savior. Oh, in the name of Jesus, we just declare that today. The redemptive work of Christ. Jesus said, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Matthew 16, 9, I will give you keys to the kingdom. Keys mean you can access something. You can open a door or you can close a door. You can lock it or open it with a key. That's what he's saying here. You have authority to open something up, to open heaven over this neighborhood. To say, come, hallelujah, word of God to this neighborhood. Maybe not just through all of us, but maybe through other people. Come. Word of God, come. Hallelujah. So I give you keys of the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth, that is whatever you, you know, you lock up. Lock up the work of the enemy. Lock him up. Praise God. Bind him. Put the cuffs on him that he can't do the work that he plans to do. And loose, loose on earth. Hallelujah, the work of heaven. Loose it. Let those things be loosed that are loosed in heaven. Jesus said, I give you this. We need to operate in that daily. You need to operate that in your workplace. You go into your workplace, whatever you're doing, and you say, I just loose heaven into it. I just bind the enemy's work up in my workplace, and I loose heaven. I loose the work of heaven. I loose angels. Hallelujah. Ministering spirits. Uh, Maureen spoke that this morning. There's ministry spirits assigned to the saints to do the work of God. Hallelujah. Ready and available to work the neighborhood here, to work your place of work. The redemptive work of Christ restored your authority. What was given in the Garden of Eden is now restored authority to the people of God. To the people of God. It's our covenant. And we've entered his rest. We can do this from a place of rest, not agitation. You can be at peace and be very authoritative. You can manage the kingdom. You're given that. You're managers of the kingdom. You're manager of God's resources. And the greatest resource you have is his word. Manage his word. Manage, hallelujah, the spirit that's within you. Allow Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. Can you say amen today? Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, let's just pray as we just wind up today. Father, just thank you for your people today. I thank you what you've given us through the creation and the redemption, Lord God. You established humanity to have dominion. And, Lord Jesus, we lost it, but you got it back for us. You got it back at the cross in your death and resurrection, and we are a restored people. We've been restored. Hallelujah. We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We lack nothing. Hallelujah. We have all things in him. Thank you today for who we are. Thank you that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you today, Lord, that we have a restored, hallelujah, authority to walk this earth and to influence it for your kingdom 
and for eternity. And everybody in Jesus' name said, amen. Hallelujah. Well, bless you.